Hi friend, Niklas here from Your Audio Solutions. Hope you're doing well and welcome to today's episode. On the episode today, we have producer, recording and mixing engineer Tom Sirowski. Tom has worked with bands such as Mastodon, Pearl Jam, Velvet Revolver, Incubus, to just name a few. However, before Tom moved to Los Angeles to work at Henson Recording Studio, Tom lived in Ohio where he worked as a grave digger. And that's the first time I interviewed anyone who has worked as a grave digger, so that was pretty cool. <laughs> um, however, Tom got a chance to move to Los Angeles and work and work at Henson Recording Studio, and that's where he ended up working for producer Brendan O'Brien, who I'm sure you have heard of. He's done some killer records as well. Uh, but that's where Tom ended up working and ended up working for Brendan as his engineer. And that's where Tom's career took off. And now he's done killer, killer records with Brendan uh, as his engineer. And he also produces his own record for bands and artists. It was a real pleasure talking to Tom. And I think you're going to love this interview as well. However, before we get into the interview, I'd love for you to subscribe to the channel. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit subscribe. If you're listening to Apple Podcasts, subscribe too and leave a rating. Uh, and Spotify, you can subscribe. I don't think you can leave a rating. I'm not sure. Uh, but please do that. It'll help the channel grow and help get more guests on the show. I don't really appreciate your support. Uh, also, don't forget to subscribe to the email list where you can get exclusive access to interviews before the public gets them and a chance to submit questions, attend Q&As, which is an up and coming thing. So I'd love for you to join. There's a link to it in the description below. Uh, just enter your email address and your name and you're on the list. But that's it for promotion. Let's get into the interview with Tom. Well, Tom, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Been looking forward pleasure to be. Awesome. <laughs> um, and when I was doing my research on you, um, this is a random question to start with, but I'm going to start there anyway. Uh, okay. Actually, I was deliberating with myself. Is this okay to start with or not? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but my, my first question is going to be if it's true that you were actually um, a grave digger before you, you moved to L.A. I was a grave digger before I moved to Los Angeles. Yes, that was... Uh, Tell me it more about was, that. I, my, my mother worked for the safety service director in my hometown and I, I was going to go to full sale. Is this before or after full sale? No, this is after full sale. Right. I, I needed a job. I needed like, I needed to make money sure. and I was working, I was working at night. I was working at a country club as a, as a, like a pantry cook. And I was like, man, okay, whatever. I just, I, I needed to do more with my, I wanted to make more money. I wanted to get, get out to LA, all of this stuff. Okay, great. I'll go work for the city. I talked to my mom, what kind of jobs are available at the city? And because I didn't want to like go through all the hoops of working as a full-time employee, I went part-time and they had a part-time gig at the graveyard, which, wow. you know, we, there's two, there's two grave, uh, three graveyards that the city of Elyria maintain. And so I went and got a job working for the graveyard and just, you know, did a lot of grass mowing. I definitely wow. buried some people, but mostly I was just like weed eating and, and, and mowing grass, which is very, um, it's one of those things. Like I'm very happy washing the car and stuff like that. It's like kind of like a Zen thing for me. And mm -hmm. as, as well as mowing the, like anytime I go back to Ohio to see my family, if it's summertime, I'm like, Hey, I mow the grass. It's just something I like yeah, to do. Yeah. So it was, it was almost, it was, you know, it was just a, it was a thing. It wasn't, I mean, yes, I was, a, I was, I did bury a couple people and, right. and I worked in the winter time in Ohio digging graves, which is a whole nother thing. Is it? It's just, you know, it's Ohio and you know, the ground, well, the ground freezes three feet down. So, ah, uh, you know, you got, you have to dig through a bunch of ice before you, you know, it's a, it's a tough it's tough in the winter time and it's cold and you're out in the middle, you know, there's no, it's, I don't, it's, I uh, <laughs> it was a whole thing. It was a whole thing, but yes, that's, I did. I was a grave digger. But I guess it sounds worse than it actually is, right? 
I, don't I know think if that, that there was bad, a. But... I'm sure there was a time where you know, the, the, well, the, the the in in my mind, Grave Digger is a guy that is digging graves in the middle of the night, and it's spooky, and it's a horror movie or something like that. And so it it wasn't that at all. I wore over I wore overalls. It was yeah. daytime job. It was yeah, yeah. It wasn't that night. <laughs> not, none of that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Um, yeah. But so before you went to Full Sail, uh, so you said you grew up in uh, Ohio. Uh, yes. Uh, where's Full Sail? Which state is that in? Full Sail is in Winter Park, Florida, which is uh, wow. a, a little bit north of uh, Orlando. I see. Uh, Middle of the state. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how was uh, Ohio growing up in? How did that lead to you wanting to pursue the the audio path? Well, I uh, was always involved with music in school. I, I grew up, I learned how to play violin, quit that because I wanted to play trumpet, played trumpet all through high school, was in marching band, stuff like that. Uh, it, 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 mostly sort of was in the arts, drama, stuff like that uh, when I was younger. And um, that progressed into being trying to start a band. What, what else are we going to do? We're, we're a bunch of band nerds. We're going to, we got to start a band. We got to be cool. We got to like make girls like us. So we started, I started a band with some friends, um, where I, I sang and, uh, attempted to play guitar because I had no idea how to play guitar. Um, <laughs> I just kind of knew how to make sounds. And I had a, a job where I could buy sort of cheap things to make my guitar sound weird. So I, I did that. And, um, at one point in time, I realized I was not getting any better at, uh, at playing guitar or anything like that. I try to play drums. Okay, whatever. I could kind of play the drums. I could kind of play guitar. By no means am I a guitar player or a drummer. So, uh, needed to figure something out because I wanted to work in music. I didn't want to, there was nothing else that interested me mm. at all. Um, f fast forward, uh, a, fr a friend that was in one of those bands in high school, uh, was a kid named Brian Humphrey. Um, he, I knew he had he was going to go to this school in Florida called Full Sail. Uh, I didn't really know a lot about it. He had told me about it, um, and and one summer night I was running around in my neighborhood with some friends, and I see Brian getting out of a car, sort of down the street. We had mutual. He went to a different high school, but we just he was a guitar player. You just kind of find those people that you, 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 oh, there's a kid at EC that plays guitar. We should have him play in our band. He's yeah, way, yeah. good. <laughs> Um, un unfortunately for Brian, he just kind of liked to play Dave Matthews band songs and like stuff like that. And we we're just, that's not what we were doing. So, um, right. he was only in the band for a couple days, but he was a friend. <laughs> so yeah. see him getting out of a car, uh, we're, you know, running around and uh, he starts telling me, Hey Tom, this, that, and the other. And I went to this school and it was amazing and all this stuff and, uh, um, learned how to engineer and pro tools and everything. And, uh, I said, okay. I mean, I, I was in, I was going to Lorain County Community College at the time. I had no idea what I was doing at college. I didn't want to, it would, it just seemed like, uh, you know, more high school to me and which I, if it, if it wasn't for band and, and stuff like that in high school, I would have, it was just boring, boring. Right. Um, so did some research, talked to my parents, decided it was something that I wanted to do. Um, they said, okay, well, you need to make some money because it's not cheap to go to full sale. You got to make some money. There's no scholarships. It's a trade school or whatever. And right. I got a job working at a, a machine shop um, to make some money. And I said, okay, I'm going to work here for three months. And that's, I'm, I'm leaving for full sale on this day. I'm going to work here for three months. I'm going to, all the money I make, I'm going to take with, you know, and use at full sale. And so I did that, went to full sale, um, which was a, a, like a 13 month program. Um, Right, so I, you know, I, it's very short. Mm. Uh, it, it's really like, uh, t l teaching you enough so that you can, um, get your foot in the door right. and, uh, work at a studio because most studios would not hire you unless you had some sort of a degree from somewhere, whether it be Berkeley school of music, right. um, which had a record, you know, re record producing or a uh, recording program. Sure. Um, I know there's a school in Chillicothe. A couple of friends of mine went to a school, I believe it's in Arizona. Hmm. Um, a couple of friends of mine, my friend, Kevin Mills went to it. I think it was Arizona. I can't remember. Right. Um, anyway, did that graduated, moved back to Ohio, didn't do anything with audio for about two years. 
because I, I was uh, I, I had no I think I was a little just scared. I was a little bit scared to leave town. Mm-hmm. I don't know what it was. Sure. I got a couple other jobs. That's when I was working as a grave digger. And now, how old uh, were you when you when you uh, finished full sale? I finished full sale. I think I was about. I think I was like 22 or wow. 23, probably 22, That's something very, like that. Very young. Very young. Yeah. Very young. Um, and. Uh, so I was in Ohio working those other jobs and, you know, n- not really having the greatest relationship with my, uh, my parents based on the fact that I went to school for a trade and I was not doing that trade. Right. So my parents were kind of like, what the, what is happening right now? What do we do? What do you do? What did you do? What did you, what, did, come on, get it together. I remember vividly, I got a phone call from my friend, Brian Humphrey, that told me about Full Sail. And he said, Hey man, not sure what you're doing right now. I'm working at this studio in LA, um, Henson recording studios, Mm -hmm. which is the old A&M records. Um, and, uh, two people just quit and two people got fired in the same week. Uh, and they were all runners. And he said, listen, call this guy who was the chief engineer at the studio. His name's Alex Gibson. Uh, call Alex, um, and say, tell him i told you to call and to see if you can get, see if you can get an, uh, an interview or, uh, you know, just see what's, what's going on. I call Alex. Uh, I, I vividly remember sitting on the back dock of the, uh, the, uh, country club that I worked at. You walk out the back door, you're like a loading dock. I was talking to Alex on the phone and, and he didn't know that I knew that there were four job openings for what I was looking for. <laughs> right. He just, he, he was sort of like, you know what? I, I'm not really sure we have anything available right now. I'm going to get back to you. Um, knowing someone that already worked at the studio was a great thing for me knowing Brian. So Brian, this is Brian helping me twice now in my, in my right, career, right, right. just kind of even like getting things going on. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, So Alex, I get off the phone with Alex. I'm like, okay, this is interesting. I hadn't even talked to my parents at this time. Brian called me. I called Alex right away. I hadn't talked to my parents at all, so they don't know any of this is happening. Um, Within the hour, Alex called me back and said, hey, so listen, we don't usually do interviews over the phone, but because you're friends with Brian and we love Brian and Brian is sort of a rising star here at the studio, Hmm. if you can be here in two weeks – you have a job nice. working at Henson Recording Studios. So I basically just buttoned everything up, quit both my jobs, yeah. packed a bag, got on a plane, and and uh, my my um my cousin Michelle Saint Marie lived in L.A. already. She had moved there the the previous year. So I I called her and said, Hey, can I come just like sit sleep on your couch for a little bit while I just fi- figure things out? Um. So I went and stayed with her for about a week. Brian had an apartment there in L.A. Right. with his sister. And, uh, I just said, Hey man, I'm, I don't really have anything going. I can't like figure out like a, an apartment or anything. I got no startup money, uh, but I got the job. Mm. Can I sleep on your couch? So I couch surfed on Brian. So that's Brian helping me three times. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. at that point in time, I got a lot, <laughs> I got a lot, uh, to thank, uh, Brian for, right, yeah. uh, just in getting all this stuff together, um, in LA. Well, was, um, was, uh, is Brian still uh, active in the music industry or? Funny story. Brian left the music industry. His father is, uh, was a, uh, Catholic deacon right. growing up, which, uh, he, uh, uh, a deacon is, uh, not quite a priest, uh, in, in, uh, the Catholic church. He can get married and have kids, he, but he's, he's not like a full priest. Right. Brian. So Brian kind of grew up in the, in church. Brian quit the music industry and is now a Catholic priest. Right. He completely finished all of that stuff. Uh, I believe it was just like last year around this time he was ordained a Catholic priest and I cool. keep in touch with him here yeah. and there. You know, he, um, I just, you know, it's, he, we come from the same town. It's, it's a, it's a thing. He knew a lot of my, my family that in the town, because I had, you know, I went to public school. Some of my family went to Catholic school. So he just, I just, he, we're just, we have this uh, relationship. We don't really need to keep in touch every day. Right, right, right. Uh, when we, when we talk, it's sort of like, you know, we just yeah. saw each other. So but that's um, funny how, how life can take different paths, you know? Uh, absolutely absolutely yeah i i i agree with that so but it's very yeah it's still very awesome that he did bring you in 
to the industry. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, I would him him vouching for me, um, him vouching for me at the studio, telling the manager and the chief engineer that I would be a good addition at the studio. I, I'm still I'm still close with Alex Gibson, who hired me, and uh, Fariel. Um, Ganje, who is the st uh, studio manager right, right. there. She was not the studio manager when I started. She basically was, uh, she was the assistant to the manager and, uh, she very close friend of mine still runs the studio. Um, and, uh, I still go work there. It's a little, it's a little iffy there right now with, uh, with the uh, pandemic, everything, mm -hmm. it, the studio is a little bit um, not, it's not, it's not shut down at all. Right. It's just, unless you are working in one of the rooms, uh, they're, they're you know, it's all kind of closed off. Everything's, sure. they got to keep everything safe. You yeah. know, they're reopening they, you don't want any issues reopening you have to close again. So they're just, exactly. they're being, they're being super smart about it. But, but the lot, the recording studio is on the old, um, Charlie Chaplin lot. So it's oh, okay. a, a compound and there's right. other buildings there. And, um, the producer that I worked for, for 10 years, Brennan O'Brien mm. has a production room there. And so I, well, so, so that is, is that Henson studio? Henson there? recording, Henson yeah, yeah, recording yeah. studios. The production room is uh, just on the Henson lump company lot. Ah, I see. Oh, so there's yeah. more than recording studio there or that's, is it all, or the whole thing is recording studio? There's a big the one of the buildings is a recording studio. There's a sound stage there. Right, There's right, a lot right, of right. offices there. Movie right. movie uh, production companies have offices there. Um, yeah. uh, there's a lot that goes on there. Yeah, because I never heard about that studio until yeah I started researching about you actually, and it seems like an awesome place. Like oh, funny. It's enough. amazing. Yeah. Uh, it's it's. I would. I've been to a bunch of studios. I've been to some great studios. I would say Henson's probably the best studio in Los Angeles. <laughs> it is classic it is beautiful inside everything works which is a big deal yeah, um yeah. uh the rooms are immaculate they're just they sound incredible they all sound different and some incredible records have come out of there the the studio a and started in the 60s and just the most amazing things have happened in that studio there's a lot of great history and uh and it's still it's continuing to build on that even to this day, there's the, I don't know. I, I think that records are made a little bit differently. Now people have production rooms, people have, they're just making records in their house. I mean, I know producers that produce entire songs on flights from New York to LA and they show up wherever and do work vocals on it and mix it. And it's done. There's not records are made a little differently now than, uh, even when I started, yeah. uh, and, and, uh, so, um, but if we, if we uh, go back to you when you just moved to LA, how how was it like a twenty, three, four year old young man coming to LA, working in the studio? Was that also your first studio experience, or it was my first studio experience? Um, I had only lived away from home when I went to Full Sail in Florida. I, I, I was I I just just you know I was a. Uh, Ohio boys lived at home and, you know, it was awesome. I, all my friends are still there. I still love to go to Ohio. Um, right. by no means was itching. You know, I, I know a lot, I know some people, um, that are, you know, they, they get done with whatever they need to get done with where they're from and they're out. They just want to go. And I, I love Ohio. I, I still go back and it's, it's great. Mm -hmm. Um, but moving to LA was a, it was, it, it, I'm moving from a small town in Ohio to one of the biggest cities in the United States, one of the biggest cities in the, in the world. And, um, it was a, it was a shock. I, I, I flew in to San Diego. I have family there. My uncle had helped me uh, find a used car and I bought the car and drove up to LA okay. and nice. had to figure it out. The greatest thing that ever happened to me moving to a big city was the fact that I was working at a studio as a runner and I had to get in my car and drive around town all day. I had to figure out within the first two months, I knew where everything was right. because that's what my job was. I had to drive um, around town, pick up people's food, right, right. Just all of that. I had to f know all of those things uh, immediately. So, um, so yeah, it was, how, it, it was, it was, was it, easy. Go ahead. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. Uh, was it, uh, did you ever find, cause this is, this, this was my own experience uh, when I started in studios and it was a big shock to me. <clears throat> um, the, the hours, w was that ever a big, Shock to you, or you just knew that was going to be the case? Because I didn't know for um, some reason. Oh, <laughs> uh, I knew, and and actually, the way that Full Sail worked when I went there, um, I'm 
I'm sure it still works that way, especially for my program, is that that school is open 24 hours. Sure. So um, each day you have a four-hour lecture and a four-hour lab. Lectures are typically during the day and labs are typically during uh, at night. And sometimes I would have to go to school at one o'clock in the morning and I'd have a four hour class starting at one o'clock in the morning. And that is specifically designed to get you ready to work in a studio because right. the hours are um, intense. I, I, I remember I remember as a runner. Because the way that you move up in a studio is you're a runner and, and uh, someone someone in a room, they need some help, whatever it is. Um, and you just get yanked into the room and, and all of a sudden you're, you're working on a session. Um, and so in order to do that, in order to do that quickly, you had to be around a lot. So I remember, uh, I remember, um, doing my runner schedule, which was you know, whatever, eight hour shift. And immediately, as soon as I was done with my runner shift, going into a room, um, at the time, the assistant engineers at at Henson, um, that's a big deal. It's a big gig to have. You have to be, you have to know, you have to be very smart. You have to basically, you have to be an engineer to be an assistant yeah. at Henson Recording Studios. Sure. And so, um, if that if there was a room available, if there was a room that wasn't booked, um, the assistants were able to get uh, downtime, which mm -hmm. was typically free studio time for them. Right. And so. The assistants needed an assistant, and that is the runners. Yeah, yeah. And so Alex Gibson, who was the chief engineer, who because his his relationship with Brian was really good, Alex would pull me into the rooms all the time. So I would do my eight hour runner shift, and then I would go straight into the studio with Alex, and I would work for another six hours. And I remember being at the studio doing that for for days on end to the point where I used to sleep. I would just go sleep in one of the lounges mm -hmm. sometimes sleep in the fish lounge, yeah. which is sort of a, um, a common area where people meet and eat food at Henson recording studios. It's a very famous sort of, there's a big yes, fish. I, I saw, I saw a picture yeah. of it. It looks kind of yes. cozy. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's yeah. very cozy. It was all, it was it, strange enough because every, all the gear has to stay so cold. So the ACs, right. the AC in studios, it's, 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 you know, Expensive, it's yeah. always fairly high, but the yeah. fish lounge was always, the warmest place. So, um, that's, I definitely slept in the fish lounge. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, that so, but yeah, the hours, it's just, if you're determined, if it, if, if, if it's what you want to do, the hours don't mean much of anything. You are tired, but whatever, mm -hmm. you know, where you're in, in er, you know, mid twenties, yeah, get yeah. over, it, you know, yeah. rocket, you know what I'm saying? Like just, yeah. you know, so that's what you got to do it. Everybody that I know that, uh, went from being a runner to an assistant that is engineering and producing tracks and stuff. Right, now. all those got they, they all went through that and did that, and um, it 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 instills um, it instills something in you uh, that you can't get it any other way. Sure. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, completely, man. I, yeah, I agree. Uh, it's a rite of passage, I guess, a bit. Um, yes. But so, being a, a runner at uh, Hanson, did it also the the page I guess you could survive or do you have to do side jobs? Oh yeah, I don't know if um I don't I don't because Henson was the only studio that I worked at as a runner. I I just know that they didn't hire interns. You were a runner. You got you got paid right. minimum. Right, 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 right. So right. everybody got paid and you made money and you were able to pay your rent and stuff right. like that. Which that's good. Um, I know other facilities aren't that way, um, but Henson was luckily. Yeah. Perfect. Um, that's very good. It still is actually. And I, 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 they still are that way. You're, you're paid, you're paid, uh, to be a runner at right. Henson. Um, so. and is, was this also the time when you started working for Brendan or O'Brien or, um, I was, I started working for Brendan right very early on. I was, I was a runner at Henson for about two years and they put a, when I was there, there was something that happened and they put sort of a, a time period on being a runner. And once you were, you, if you were a runner for a certain amount of time, you either became an assistant or you moved on. You went and worked someplace else because not everybody that was a runner there became an assistant. You had to be sure. a certain kind of person. So sure. that put a little bit more of a, of a fire underneath me to figure out what I was doing. And, um, Became an assistant after two years, and not far um, after becoming an assistant, um, 
Brendan was coming to LA to do an audio slave record. Right. Um, the third audio slave record. Right. And he was going to do that. And we were going to do, um, the incubus record, which ended up being, um, light grenades. Mm -hmm. Um, he was going to do it back to back. And I was, I was, I had done a couple things as a third, like <laughs> You, you were in it before you become an assistant engineer as a runner. If you're working on a real session, they call you a third, which is basically, um, you do all the busy work, you do all the documentation, you make sure if they're, if they're mixing your check, you're doing all the mixed documentation. Um, you're the personal runner for the studio so that, um, other runners can be freed up to do other things because the studio is getting busy. Um, they need, they need other runners around. So I was a third on a record that Brendan did, um, uh, wallflowers record rebel sweetheart it was called and so i had worked with brendan uh, fariel the studio manager knew that brendan liked me and so she put me on as an assistant engineer wow. um for that audio slave record and then after that the we went right into the incubus record so i did two records with brendan very early on in my assisting career and that was sort of like in the frying pan learning how to be an assistant engineer and take care of things. And, and, um, and it was great. It was a fantastic learning experience. I can imagine. Um, yeah. but so you said being in the frying pan, so to speak, uh, being in the hot seat, I guess, uh, how, how, how was that experience? Like being thrown in? I mean, I guess you've done session before, obviously. So you weren't, you know, fresh out of the, the box, so to speak, but how was that experience? Sure. Well, how did you handle? How do you handle this stress? I guess the, you've heard the the there's a there's a, a, a phrase that people say call it says fake it until you make it. So if someone says, <laughs> "Can you do something?" If someone says, "I need you to do this," can you do that? Do you know how to do that? You either know how to and say mm -hmm. yes, or you don't know how to and say yes, and then go figure out what it is that you need to do to get that done. Mm -hmm. Go ask somebody. You're working at one of the greatest studios ever in the world. There's bound to be someplace in that. If you don't know something, there's guaranteed somebody in the studio that's going to know how. So there was a lot of me running out of the studio, finding somebody, talking to them, and then running back to the studio. But, you know, as I walk out of the studio very calmly, not like I'm in a panic, then I'm panicking as I run down the, the hallway, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. walk back in very gingerly. I got this. I know exactly what to do. Nice. Um, did a lot of that. And that's how you learn. That's just you, yeah. you, you, that place coming up was just, I, I, I don't, I know that, the, I know that there's other good studios and I know that there's other good p facilities to learn in, but at that place, it was, uh, and is, I'm, sh I'm sure still is, um, just an incredible place to learn mm -hmm. how to, how to do, how to become an engineer and just be in the studio. You, you can, you can be the greatest engineer in the world and not be able to be in a studio because you have to have a certain sort of, um, the way that you carry yourself, you have to know when to know when to not talk, know when to talk, know when to not even, you, you can't, sometimes, Sometimes something gets really intense and you need to just blend into the wall. That's that meme of Homer Simpson backing yeah, yeah, into, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? You yeah. have to be that. You have to camouflage yourself into, into nothing. Just, and, uh, I mean, and that place me, taught you that. Yeah. I mean, it reminds me, um, uh, I interviewed Sean Everett some year ago and he, he said basically the same thing, uh, he, he used to say yes to stuff. He completely had no idea how to do. But yeah. he, like you, uh, he just figured yep. it out, and you know, that, I mm -hmm. think I think that's a yeah, it's a it's a common uh, thread with with people, you know, who yeah, I bet anybody like, that's like made it as an engineer, that's a, a a thing that they experienced. Yeah, it's it's just a, a a way to you have to don't ever tell anybody no. Then you're then you're then you're a problem. Then you're not a problem solver. Sure, uh, you're a problem causer. Yeah, and want to always be the other thing. But so. have, have there ever been a situation where you said yes, but you couldn't figure it out or. Well, I have selective memory, <laughs> so I can't think of <laughs> any time. You That's know, good. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't, I, just, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think about the, the, the bad stuff at all. Sure. I kind of just, I have memories of, of when I, when I, um, save the day. Right. 
you right. know, in the studio, like I can't I'm just, you know, just on top of things, you know? Yeah. Um, so, uh, I can't, I mean, maybe, I mean, I do, I recall one time, I mean, I recall messing up mm-hmm. in the studio, doing something wrong, getting, get, you know, you're like, uh, I remember that, but if that happens. Know. Yeah. That's, that's totally normal. That happens. Obviously. Yeah. 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 But, um, uh, yeah. But that, that's cool, man. Um, but so, when when did you go completely freelance? Then, uh, how many years have you done that? Were you still on and off with with Brendan and other producers? Or I do I do work I I still work with Brendan. I talk to Brendan a couple times a week still. Um, right. he, he's he, he's not he's he's mostly like working like doing songwriting and stuff like that. And I'm and and so I I've, I've been freelance, fully freelance, sort of away from Brendan. Basically, how it went was. I was assisting on records that Brendan did whenever he came to Henson and he and his engineer, Nick Dadia were going to part ways. Nick was going to go to uh, Australia. He's going to move to Australia. And Brendan had five records that he needed to do that year. And, um, I didn't know that at the time. I just know, Hey man, he he came to me, said, Hey man, I'm going to do this record. Um, can you, will you engineer this record with me or Mm -hmm. for me? And you say yes when that happens, um, no matter what, no matter how f- scared to death of you, whether or not you know what you can, are you going to like, are you going to mess it up? Maybe, but you say yes to yeah. those sorts of questions. Yeah. So, uh, that was a, that was a, my chemical romance record that ended up not really coming out in any, I came out in, in a, in a, um, f- like five um, a side, B side sort of singles. It didn't come out as a full record, which wow. I'm, I don't really remember why that happened that way, but that's, that's what happened. Um, but w- about, about a couple, just like a couple weeks into making that record, Brendan said, Hey, I've got about, I've got about five records I need to make this year. Um, I, I don't know if you want to be my engineer and you also say yes to that question. So, so that's when I became his engineer. I would, I was not associated with the studio. I was an, I was an engineer at that time. I, I guess I'm freelance because I, I can do other things with other people, but my, right. my loyalty lies with Brendan. If there's a record that needs to be made with him, he, if I'm working on something and he says, Hey, I need you to come do this thing with me. I got to shut that other thing down and go work for him. So, yeah. um, I mean- so that Go ahead. Yeah, that that's sort of an engineer's dream, I guess. Um, I've had a few friends who done the same uh, route, so to speak. Uh, sure. I, I don't know if you agree or not, but um, it seems it's, it's nice to have that work stability. I guess you can call it. Oh, it was it was amazing. Yeah, yeah having that and and knowing that you're going to work on. I mean, I when I I'm, I'm a uh, grunge music for me, whether you like the term or not, that's what it was. Um, Pearl Jam, all of those records uh, in the 90s, Stone Temple mm-hmm. Pilots, all the records, Chili Peppers, Blood yes, Sugar, Sex, Magic, like these records that uh, I would I would pine, I would just read everything on all of it. And I just, I loved all of that music. And that was the guy that was making him, like this is the guy. And, mm-hmm. and so for me, it was like, I, I'm, I, what did I do to deserve this amazing opportunity? I have no idea. I'm going to make the best of it. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so, I mean, and then he, I get, you know, I get to meet my heroes, you yeah, know, yeah, exactly. at that point in time, him, him. And then also the artists that he's worked with are my heroes. These, mm-hmm. these people. Um, so, so yeah, that was a, as a, still a big deal to me. It's mm-hmm. still a, a, a huge deal to be, to have been able to be his engineer and, and, uh, and so it, I mean, I am where I am because I did those records with him. So yeah. I mean, yeah, really yeah, great. Yeah. We, you know, you know, um, uh, your, your, your skill is also very, uh, good, obviously. So you, you deserve all the success you've had, of course. Uh, well, I appreciate that. Thank you. But yeah. I, I, I would, I mean, I, I, le- I learned all of that stuff by staring at that guy at Brendan for whatever. I mean, I still learn from him. I'm not, you know, we're not making records the way that we were, but I still, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. yeah. when I, I still do stuff for him and I still talk and we, I'm still learning from him. And, and, uh, it was, it was, uh, just, a uh, it was a different, it was a different thing from being an assistant at Henson where I'm learning all this great stuff and I'm moving, it's another, it's the next step, um, was, was learning how to, I mean, I, I, I learned how to mix records, you know, mixing records is a, it, it's very like, it's your ears. So you can't really, you can't say to somebody, well, I, 
I'm going to teach you how to mix records, except for the technical part of it. Yeah. Um, sort of the process. Um, your ears are your ears. If you hear things in a good way, you're going to great, great mixes. If you don't, maybe it's not so, Mm -hmm. maybe not so much. Um, but I, I, mixing records, I learned how to do that from him too. I, you know, he was, he was one of the greatest engineers at the time, but you know, uh, uh, the, those first two black crows records and just the, that the blood sugar sex magic record, just the most insane, crazy sounding record. I was going to say, yeah. That's him. That's him. Exactly. He, that's his engineering, and um, and so uh, that that record that was uh, Blood Sugar. That was uh, one of the albums I rinsed. Uh, <laughs> yeah, as as a teenager, and and, and yeah. still sometimes you know. But yeah, the engineering still holds up very well. There's some, there there are some. Not I wouldn't say called funny, but I think they were more maybe fashionable back then. Uh, but the engineering is is outstanding from brendan on on that oh yeah you know yeah and it wasn't even done in a real studio it was done in a house in laurel canyon like he just put it together he put it he put that together up there i mean it's just it's great so yeah can't say good things about my experience with brendan awesome man um is, is there anything else that he taught you that sort of sticks out uh in the in the whole um he he taught me um Two of the the things that he taught me that I, I are super important to me. One is um, just to work very to, to to if you if you to work fast. We always worked fast, and um, and with that comes comes uh, decision making, hmm. and and um, I find that to be super important. We when we make records, we uh, we start. Um, there's no fixing it in the mix for us. The minute we start recording, we're mixing yeah. everything that we do. And, and so, uh, your decision making has to be on point. You can always go back and fix something. Obviously you don't want to have to, but you know, just kind of moving forward and not, not, a. there's no like taking a year to make a record. We made records very quickly. Right. Um, another thing that I learned from him is uh, if you're making a record with a band in a studio, when that band comes in to listen to their take, it has to sound like a record immediately. The, the minute they walk in there, it has to sound pretty much like a finished album. Obviously, it's just drums, bass, guitar, scratch vocals, but everything has to sound on point. Though that band needs it, they need to, and, and, and they need to, be, that reflects what they're hearing in their ears in the studio. If, if it sounds, if it sounds bad to them in their ears, they're not going to play anything right. Mm. If they walk into the studio and things don't sound great, they're not going to have the energy and the excitement necessary to get a good take. So th- there's no excuses. There's no, there's no, this is going to sound better later on when we overdub it. No. You make everything sound fantastic quickly, you know, make everything, you know, you got to get on your engineering skills. You got to be able to get drum sounds and, and, you know, 30 minutes, you know, you have to know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so everything has to happen fast and sound great. Mm -hmm. So that's, those are two things that I learned from him that are, are big deals for me. Right. And speaking of communication, what's your conversation, uh, conversations with bands, like before uh, making records, or do you mainly talk to the producer you're working with or... Was that possible? If if I'm engineering a record, I I talk to the producer. Not I, as an engineer, you just most of the time the producer is going to come t- come out and tell you if we're going to make a record. He's you know this is what we're doing and this is my idea about you know dr- the thoughts about drums and the instruments usually kind of tell you everything. If say, if 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 someone's a producer says well we're going to use this big uh, uh, Radio King kick drum. That we're going for like a, a kind of an open sound. Okay, you kind of get the idea, and you, and you do whatever it is that you think is going to sound best based on what he said. Um, sometimes the, I, I've had experiences where the, the producer will have me talk to the the band, and that's usually just to keep logistics and what they're thinking and stuff like that. Um, if I'm producing a record, I I, I just kind of get a vibe for what the band. Um, or artist is looking for in the record that they, they want to create, um, what they're listening to at the time records that they love. 
um, sounds, uh, you know, eras of music that they love, um, that sort of thing. And a lot of times the song is going to dictate that you can, I mean, you could record a- any song any way, um, you want. Um, it's all just sort of like what, what the vibe the person wants it to have. Hmm. And so, and it, you know, going back to communication, just kind of talk to people until you, it's, it's all just it, it, people's interpretations. So my interpretation, you know, when I'm producing an album or engineering an album, I'm just trying to interpret what this person tells me, hmm. um, trying to figure out what an artist wants and going from there. And what is it the artists usually want these days, if that makes sense? Do they talk to you about obviously sound? Um, uh, is there anything else they, they, that you should come out on those, in those conversations? It's, it's, uh, those, com- it's, they have, I, every you know, artists will have a different idea for a song. They want it to be sort of like a, a poppy sound. They want it to be, um, n- no, no real, um, live drums. They want it to be super, you know, the, I want this song to have be mostly synths. Um, acoustic guitars, you know, a lot of times songs are written vocal acoustic guitar. You start building up around that. And then at the end of the day, the the acoustic guitars aren't even in the song anymore. So Mm. songs take on things, uh, a lot of times and, um, what they wanted in the beginning changes based on what starts to happen a lot of times. So, um, I mean, what bands want, what artists want these days. I mean, that's a (laughs) <laughs> That's a long and involved question. That I don't really have the answer for. I think yeah, it, yeah, it's, yeah. you know they, they everybody's different and they all want different things. Sure, it's just a matter of communicating. But let's say an artist comes to you and want to work with you. Do you have any questions to like uh, to uh, sort out so you know if that's a right project or if you should let someone else take it? Do you have some specifics? Um, if someone if I'm talking to someone about I, I typically it's like. I'm, I'm a, uh, I produce records. I engineer records. I mix records. I'm not a, I'm not a musician. Mm -hmm. A lot of producers are, they can play everything. Um, so the only project I think that I would, I would hesitate it. Uh, I wouldn't even hesitate. I take that back. Mm -hmm. You just got to kind of find out what, what, um, I don't know. It's hard to say. I don't think that I would turn anything down unless the person seemed like an asshole. Right. To be honest, you know what I mean. Like, if the person, if the, uh, I'm pretty good judge of people's character and vibe. Just having a quick conversation with them, and um, if I like them, I'm on. I'm 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 in. Let's go. Um, and, and then the rest of it, we just figure out. Mm-hmm. If I got to call a guitar player to come in, if I got to figure something out, we got to get a drummer. Most of the stuff you can figure out these days with you know, got to get all the native instruments, drums, and all that kind of stuff. You can build something pretty quickly. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't know that I would, I think it would all be based. What's that? Uh, there's no elimination process, so to speak. No elimination process. I love working on records. I want to, I want to experience, I want to experience all projects. You know, I want to experience all of that stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was talking to someone else. I don't know who it was, but, uh, about, uh, bands and uh, <clears throat> that that maybe work with bands is getting less. Is that is something you have noticed too, or is it more like artist based these days? I think that that there is something to that. Um, there are still bands. The thing is, is I think that when it comes to what is popular musically right now, um, is a lot more things, things have, are, are going and have been going in a more, um, electronic direction. Hip hop is more electronic. Pop music is more electronic. A lot of that stuff can be done in a laptop mm. in someone's bedroom. Or like I said before, on a, on an airplane flight, you can do a lot of that stuff. Um, I love getting a full band into a room, live drums, guitar amps, miking everything up, that kind of stuff, because I come from an engineering background. I love yeah, all that yeah. stuff. I love the process of doing all that and then overdubbing and vocal. I just, I love all that stuff. Um, but I, that, that, um, requires a studio most of the time, unless you have a bunch of gear you can put into a house, um, and do it like that. And, um, I think that, I think that budgets for records like that are, are not as big. And so it's a little bit harder to it's just, it's just a different thing. Yeah. Yeah. 
the, the way that records are made these days. So, um, whether or not bands are going away, I think people, the music that people like or the people that the music that people, um, are listening to is less band oriented music. Mm. I mean, it seems that, like the definitely the legacy bands, if you can call them that, uh, they seem to be getting uh, maybe not bigger, but yeah, they definitely are doing well. I, I it seems like. I think that there's certain bands like U2 and Coldplay and ACDC and stuff like that. Mm. Uh, you know, Guns and Roses, that sort of thing. Yeah, that yeah. Uh, that are never. They are. They are just. They're part of our culture at this point in time. It's not even like those. Those bands don't even put out records really anymore that people care about. I mean, I guess they put out records and there's a single or whatever, but people, they want to hear, uh, they want to hear welcome to the jungle. They want to hear, they don't want to, you know what I mean? Like, it, uh, so, um, so there, I think that those bands, there's always going to be those bands. Pearl Jam's always going to be touring. Yeah, I mean, yeah. as soon as the pandemic's, you know, sort of run its course, bands will always, but I mean, you know, that sort of thing, I think that they're always going to be, um, there and, and, uh, hopefully, Hopefully, the, I, all, all things kind of come in phases in life, and maybe maybe rock and roll comes back comes back in a back you know back from back to what it was um, at some point in time. Hope we we hope. I love drums, bass, guitar, music. I mean, I love yeah, that same. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so. Yeah, it's it's awesome. Um, yeah. Well, so speaking of budgets, is that something that you have or has smaller budgets affected how you work these days or? Absolutely. I, I had to, um, about, I never worked at home. I always kind of liked to go someplace and work. I felt like I got more done. And, uh, about, uh, two years ago I was making a record and I was going to start making a record. And I said to the artist, I said, I think that we're just, we have to buy some stuff. We have to buy, uh, you know, uh um, iMac. We have to buy a, a interface. We have to buy, um, some stuff like that. Because we're not, we're going to make this record and it's going to be awesome, but we're going to do it sort of guerrilla style and we're going to work a lot from my, my apartment or your house. I'll bring some stuff out to your house. And, and so budgets these days on the records that I'm working on are basically like most part, for the most part, my fee where everything else we're kind of doing here and there and figuring things out. And I, I did a, I did a record. Um, I did a record a, a while back with this band called fiction plane. Uh, the singer from fiction plane is Joe Sumner, mm -hmm. Joe Sumner. And I just did a solo record and we did the whole record. We created, um, drum loops to make the entire record, um, pretty much recorded all the instruments and then went to a drummer named Blair Sinta's house He's got a, a drum booth and a sort of small recording studio set up in his guest house and had him play live drums on all the tracks. And that's how we ended up making a record. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. And it turns out great. I mean, I, I it, it should be coming out sooner or later and I'll make sure to get you info about that when it comes yeah, out, yeah. but awesome. super proud of it, super excited about it. And that's how we did that record, which is the complete backwards way of yeah, most yeah. <laughs> most of the, mostly that most of the time you're doing drums first and then mm. overdubbing on top of that. So That's cool. there's more editing involved with that and being an engineer and working in Pro Tools most of the time. I'm very good with editing, and so you got to get kind of like I said before. I use the word shoehorn a lot because <laughs> yeah. I have to kind of finagle things into tracks right, quite right. often, and so <laughs> in doing records that way, you got to do that. So yeah, 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 man. Um, but do you also have a, a manager or do you do everything yourself? I do everything myself just cool through word of mouth. Yeah. I have a friend that's a manager that helps me out uh, occasionally if I need things looked at and talked to about. But I, no, I have not. I've not had a manager. I've talked to a couple of managers. I just right. never really had. An, when I first started, I was doing records with Brendan. I had no reason to have sure. a manager. Yeah, I was exactly. just doing things. So and uh, haven't really. I don't know. Uh, I don't know how much managers do for producers and engineers in the way of getting them mm -hmm. gigs. Mm -hmm. I think the gigs you got to go out and get yourself. I think that they're kind of like yeah, they're yeah. You know, 
looking at contracts, stuff like that. There's no, you know, so yeah, I, mean, I don't know how, I don't know how much having a producer would really help me. Sure. Um, maybe it would, maybe it'd be great. I don't know. I just haven't, yeah. haven't had uh, experience yet. So, yeah, I mean, I think you're, you're right there. Cause I was talking to Jeremiah, uh, he's a manager from uh, GPS management. Um, he said, yeah, having a manager shouldn't be looked at as an employment opportunity, so to speak. So I think, you know, your, your idea of it seems correct. Yeah. Of the little I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's cool, man. Um, so the, 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 the pandemic we're in now, obviously, how is that? Are you just working at home now, I guess? or Just working from home. And um, as soon as, as, soon as uh, Henson started uh, letting people back on to the lot, they may have never fully closed the lot and let, let some tenants come in and work. But, um, I did everything from home. I was doing everything from home, a lot of headphone mixing. Cause my, my space is, is the spare bedroom. Um, so it's not a, it's not a, uh, acoustically friendly environment. So I have some small speakers. I have headphones that I know what they, you know, what, what I'm hearing mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of, um, listening to mixes in the car. So, <laughs> yeah. um, that sort of thing. But since, you know, the last couple of weeks I've been going in and, uh, to the production room at Henson and doing a bunch of stuff. So ah, cool. it's good to get back into the studio. I think things are, everything's going to open up and get figured out and everything's going to be fine. So yeah, I, yeah, definitely. I hope so. Um, don't know when, but hopefully sooner rather than later. <laughs> yes, I agree. Yeah. Uh, so, Tom, do you have a, a favorite failure in the studio or in real life? Or yeah, life, I guess. <laughs> Everything is real life. I, I, it's funny. When you sent the email about what we were going to talk about, I read the, the you know, we're going to talk about favorite failure. And I, all I could think of was, I no way I have no, like I, all like failures. I mean, I wish records would, would, would more people would hear them. I, I specifically recall a situation where I was the assistant engineer on a session and the producer and engineer came in. I'm going to leave everybody's names out, including bands because mm -hmm. I just, you know, no reason to even bring it up. Yeah. Um, the producer and engineer, the engineer came in and it was a situation where he came in and he said, I'm going to have you run pro tools. And that's just part of the gig. It's a little bit, it's part of the gig and for a new guy being an assistant, it could be exciting because you're like paying your dues and it's good experience. But when this happened, I was, I was, you know, I had been an assistant for a while. And if, if, if I'm assisting on a session, I was close to being done assisting at this point in time, right. um, moving on to engineering. And so for an a engineer to come in and ask me to do that, I was a little bit like, should I get paid as like a pro tools operator? It's a whole, that's a different thing. And I'm, I kind of deserve that. Anyway, that's just my thought process moving forward. The room was set up really funny. And so the pro tool system was put to the side. We were using an external clock for the pro tool system. We were using a big Ben uh, Apogee, big Ben. Um, the Apogee big Ben was set to a, a sample rate and the Pro Tools session was sent to a different sample rate. Right. So what that would do is would cause the click track coming out of Pro Tools to be the wrong time, wrong speed. And if you take that session and play it back someplace, it's going to play back at either double time or half time or something like that. Um, that, because I was put in that position, was I was – that was my fault. Right, right. And I got fired from that session. It was the first time I had ever been fired from anything. Right. And it was, I took it really hard. I was really bummed out about it. Um, the band had to come back in. They had to re-record the song. The studio had to pay for it. The studio has insurance for stuff like that. Okay, great. Right. Doesn't matter. Still bum me out. Huge, huge, but like I don't, I don't like to, I don't like to mess up and I messed up. Mm. Um, and about a week later, Brendan O'Brien was like, Hey man, will you be my engineer, <laughs> uh, on this next, my chemical romance record? I need you to engineer. So 
I was, I was hugely bummed out and I had this horrible failure that I felt like I've completely failed for about a week. And then I was, you know, I was Sylvester Stallone running up the steps in Rocky yeah, yeah. <laughs> up and down and everybody was behind me and it was amazing. Cause I had just gotten this great opportunity and it was awesome. So yeah. I did have a failure and it bummed me out. Right. Um, but it let something good better. things, good things, good thing came, good things came from it. I have that in my experience, it, uh, sometimes, uh, sort of a bad thing happens. And then all of a sudden this other great thing, exponentially better, uh, amazing thing happens right after it. So if anything ever bad happens to me, I always think to myself, well, probably got something really great happening pretty soon. So I'm going to just kind of wait for that to, to be what it is and not let myself dive into some sort of deep, yeah, gnarly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm a failure, depression sort right. of, you know, none of that's any good for anybody. So no, I mean, that's, that's, that's something that's really fascinating to me because, uh, people, you know, I look up to uh, like yourself and other people in the industry is that all this always seems to be uh, a moment where maybe it sounds like everything it felt for them that everything was going to shit but they never quit you know they just stick at it and slowly yeah. stuff got better and like you just said you could hire a Brendan instead uh yeah, that's, that's just that's something I've seen a lot in people. Uh, I just find that fascinating. Um, and have you had any other experiences when you thought maybe not a failure, but where you thought, "Oh, will this this going really slow now? When will it pick up again?" Or that's something you never experienced. I mean, I think that I think that everything comes and goes, and 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 there's everything has a flow to it. You know, you, you know, and not not just making records, mm -hmm. making money in general. People, right. you know what I mean. Unless you have a job, working for you know a steel mill, uh, and you're you know a union employee, you're always going to have that gig, and you're always going to have that money for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, in in the in the in the industry that we're in. Um, things just, they, they flow, they come and go and you just got to kind of, you know, stick with it, yeah. know that things will get better. And I think that's just in life. Things always get better. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly, man. So, yeah. 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 It's, it's a good thing to have in mind when stuff goes slow for people, um, that it will get better. Uh, <clears throat> but awesome, Tom, um, before we wrap up here, could you let people know where, they can find uh, more stuff about you, where they can hire you, where they can listen to your stuff, stuff you've done, all that. Well, you can contact me. My my uh, email address is on my website, which is Um There is music there, albums that I have engineered um, and produced on there that you can listen to little snippets. Um my my all music page is is fairly accurate, so you you know if you want to look and see what's going on there. Um, uh, I've done a couple records in the last uh, year or so that I'm super proud of that are not necessarily these huge things. Um, there's an artist named Stuart Davis okay. uh, lives in lives in I believe he lives in Boulder. He lives in Colorado. I think it's Boulder. Okay. Could be wrong <laughs> about that. Um, he did a, uh, basically he hired me to engineer a record for him. Um, and I ended up producing and mixing the record as well. Cool. Um, and that record's on iTunes. It's called temple whore. And while it sounds gnarly and some, maybe some sort of weird death metal record, it is not any <laughs> of those. Things. It's very, um, I would say it's got like a little bit of an XTC vibe to it. He's, an incredible artist. I really, really love how the record turned out and sounds. Um, I, I'm very proud of that record. I also, um, I'm, I met a, I met a guitar player from Venice named Josh Landau, crazy good guitar player. And he's got a band, um, called the shrine who have made a bunch of rock records, really, really cool band. Um, he recorded uh, about four songs in his in his garage. He's got a whole sort of studio set up in his garage. Uh, definitely sounds like a garage record, but I cool. I helped. I did some overdubbing and a lot of um, mix magic to make this this uh, this EP what it is. And that e so the band's called the Shrine. The EP's called uh, 
Cruel World. Okay. Um, really great, fun record, rock and roll. Um, and another record that I that I I done recently is Joe Sumner's solo record, which is not out yet. Right. You can find Joe Sumner on social media, um, and his social media will allow us to know when this record comes right, out right, and right. stuff. Joe, Joe's fantastic. Joe, not only is he, uh, you know, create his own music, he was in fiction playing. He's doing the solo right, record. Right. He, uh, was part of the, um, the celebrating David Bowie tours with, uh, um, a lot of David Bowie's, uh, former bandmates, uh, Corey Glover of living color was on that tour. A uh, girl who I, I can't remember her name, but she was in the Janis Joplin, um, Broadway musical, crazy good singer. I can't remember her name right now. It's an interesting name. Um, but Joe just freaking awesome singer, awesome dude, very good friend. I'm super excited about that record. Um, Joe's dad, I don't know if you've done any of this research. Joe's dad is sting. Um, so oh, okay. no, I missed that actually right, famous, right. you know, lineage and music. Um, but, uh, met, went to, went to, uh, sting had a musical going on in LA for a while, uh, the, called the last ship. And I went and met, uh, met him at an after party and, um, Joe introduced uh, me to him as, Hey, this is Tom. He produced my record and, and sting so graciously complimented the, uh, this, the record so lush, all this stuff. So that was like a highlight of my life. I mean, this guy is like, uh, I mean, when I first learned what music was, when I first saw MTV, all I ever wanted to do is see the police videos and, and, uh, Tina Turner and like, you know, David Lee Roth, Van Halen, all, uh, all that. That's all it was to me. So just meeting him and him saying that something that he and, uh, he and his son created was, was, uh, great, was, was awesome to experience. So yeah, that record, I'm very proud of, super excited about it coming out. Um, nice, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's called all I can really think of that I've been doing lately. Yeah. I leave yeah. links to the stuff I, I can leave links to, except the Joe Som Sumner thing. Um, but the rest I'll, I'll leave links to uh, so people can Great. check it out. Uh, and are you on social media at all, like Instagram and stuff? I'm on Instagram. My Instagram is private. It's mostly pictures of my dog. <laughs> all, right, <So>. cool. <laughs> all right. All right. Yeah. <laughs> we'll leave that out. <laughs> yeah. Awesome, Tom. Well, yeah, thanks for coming on. It was a real pleasure. I appreciate it, man. Thank you for the opportunity. It's been nice talking to you. I like I like strolling down. I like remembering all the, you know what I mean? It, 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 it you come, you come, th you do all this stuff and, and, uh, you know, work is work and day to day. And, you know, people have been in their houses for th three months and stuff like that. Um, you forget if you work in the music, music industry, you forget sometimes how amazing it is and how lucky you are to do that kind of a thing. So mm. it's been good talking to you. It, it's, it's made me feel good. So I appreciate it. Thank you, man. Right on. Thank you, Tom, for coming on. It was a pleasure talking to you, and I hope you, the listener, enjoyed it as well. Again, feel free to leave a comment. Let me know what you think about the interview. Also, don't forget to subscribe, leave a rating if you're listening to Apple Podcasts, and also subscribe, of course. And don't forget to join the email list where you get exclusive access to interviews before the public. And you also get a chance to attend private Q&As, uh, which is something I'm trying out. Uh, so feel free to join. It's free. Just enter uh, your email address and your first name and you're on the list. Uh, but that's it for today's episode. I'll see you guys very soon again.